Yes! Sword. been back in Australia seven days now missed the place like hell London was freezing teaching over there is a nightmare and now I know I've just uh, reiterated the point how I've missed it so bad check out this decided to get away for a couple of days to go fishing and had a look on Google Maps and I've brought myself to well close enough to heaven I reckon Fingers crossed the fishing is going to be awesome. The weather's sick. Uh, there's wind up, which isn't perfect, but who really cares? It's a tight little creek. Hopefully, I'm out of the out of the wind and um, maybe even get some fly fishing in. I'm pretty damn excited. This is fantastic. Can't wait. I've right, just been driving out to my spot and a couple of corrugations um, about three kilometers in and I can hear this rattle the all too familiar rattle I've heard it before uh, but not on my trailer it's the first and one of my guards has come loose so um, I've got a little bit of heavy wire and some rope nothing like a dodgy job to get me to the fishing spot so um, I'm gonna put that together and hopefully it'll get there and I won't have to tear the whole thing off Well, I think it's better than when we started. Just get a photo to annoy my brother. Well, I hope you're ready for a little bit of adventure. This place looks fantastic. I've had a good look at it on Google Maps. I've not fished it before. I drove down late last night after work and um, set up camp and haven't slept in a wink because I'm so damn excited and because the mozzies are just crazy. But um, hopefully there's plenty of jacks in there. Let's go and have a look. Yeah, so the motor just died. Don't you hate when that happens? Everything starts going through your mind about what it could be and how you know, far away from home you are, how stuck you are. Make that nice and firm. 
The problem's not been actually with the motor, it's with the fuel line. All the corrugations on the way getting here and the vibrations, I've pinched the fuel line between the tinny and the fuel tank. So it's been leaking and left the air in the line. Hopefully that'll do the trick and get me back going again. Big mangrove jack. This is gonna need the net this one. Come on buddy. Up you get. Just gotta be careful not to pull the hooks. When you get a good one like this close to the boat, I'm using a sticky rod and he's not even hooked properly yeah that's a good fish oh you're a corker that's the lure that's done the damage yes oh on the paws another good fish it's got to be a jack too because they just pull so hard it is it's another good jack oh Here, fella. Yep. Jeez. You know, these big ones, they love a pause. You almost get them to the point where you've got to forget that you're fishing. That is another crack of fish. Watch him chew down and all that. Jeez. They're so strong. What another awesome fish, hey? Off you go, fella. Well, I've found the quiet section of the river, so I thought I'd just pull over and share with you a couple of my ideas about lure selection and how I like to use them for mangrove jack. What's the most important thing about a fishing lure? Is it its size and its shape? Or what about the whole colour debate? I've got my ideas, and I don't think they're what you're expecting. At the age of 13, I read a fishing article written by David Green, I think it was in Fishing Monthly, about making your own fishing lures. And from then on, I've been like a child possessed. Every day after school, I'd nick off into the shed and turn up fishing lures. Mostly made out of timber, but any material I could get my hands on, like cutlery or... Mum started asking questions when her chopping board started shrinking and my brother's bodyboarding flippers were gone. Well, my neighbours must have hated me. I'd be out there for hours, well in after dark, uh, turning up these lures with a high-speed drill and a sanding pad attachment. But in 97, I entered into the Hins Dam Fishing Classic, as I had done for five years previous, but that year changed everything. By pure luck, I won a charter aboard Des Charles's bass boat. And if you don't know Des, he's like the fishing world's version of Gandalf from Lord of the Rings in looks and in fishing wizardry. 
So I'm out on Desert's boat, and I hadn't caught a thing. I had a live shrimp sitting over the side, and I'm looking at all these rods lined up with spinner baits and divers and poppers. And I said to Des, I said, Des, can we use those lures? He looked me straight in the eye and said, well, can you cast them? And at that point, my record fishing session was six bass. And it took us a day and there were four of us in the boat trolling lures. I'd never even considered casting lures. Cast and retrieve fishing, I'd only ever trolled. But it was in that moment I realised just how important all those years of designing lures and testing them in my backyard pool had been. Because I'd cast them down the end of the pool right up against the edge and then drag them through the water to try and check their action or modify the shape of their bib to get the right action going as they swam. But I never thought about the effect that all that casting had had on my fishing. And in that moment, I realised that Des looked at me and said, if you can land that lure right under that log, that's where the bass's nose is. But if you miss, then we're going to spend all afternoon going into the grass and chasing your fishing lure and we're going to lose all our fishing time. We finished up with 17 bass that afternoon, all of them casting lures at targets. And since then, that's been the biggest changer in my fishing success and my catch rates. And it's the biggest piece of technical, technical advice I can share with anyone about chasing mangrove jack with fishing lures. Now, with that in mind, it doesn't matter as much if you're trolling or searching for fish. But um, I like to use a bait caster. Um, mainly because of the way that it helps with your casting. And the hints I've got on fishing lures and lure selection, it mainly has to do with castability and the way that they're made. Nothing to do with brand. I'm not sponsored, so I can use whatever lures that I like to use when I'm out on the water. Um, it's all got to do with castability for me. So lures with these rattles and casting chambers, generally they'll have like a tungsten bearing or a steel bearing that shoots to the back of the lure when you cast it and that'll help fire the lure in directly straight at the snag and even when it hits it'll shoot under the water for half a metre to get right up in the fish's face and right under that structure. Also suspending lures, I just love them and if they suspend flat like a really natural suspension of a fish like you'll see a mullet or a herring or even a whiting the way that they'll sit in the water just dead flat that's going to help as well. Lures that dive like this, that's fine naturally. If you've watched fishing shallows, they'll go and search along the bottom like that. But if it's doing that in mid-water, okay, that's not a very natural sort of an action, is it? Generally, fish are going to take something that sits dead flat when it's suspending. Something that I've worked out over the years, and I think it's a little tip that's worth taking note of. So that's generally what I'll look for. Never mind brand or even size and that sort of thing. Casting accuracy and then getting a lure that will fire directly straight into the snag, they're the two biggest things that I look for. The reason for the casting chamber, heavy vibes and jigs and soft plastics will do the same thing, but the casting chamber on a diving lure is going to help you get straight a straight line right to the snag. If you're casting with a poor technique, especially with a spinning outfit, um, if you haven't worked on your technique to fire a lure in straight and backwards, you're going to have a lure sailing all over the place, especially if there's a little bit of wind. And that's going to create a slack line, and it's also going to throw your lure away from the snag slightly. So your repeatability goes down. But that direct line right to the lure is so important for a couple of reasons. Some days the jacks are going to respond to a lure that's moving as soon as it hits the water. And on other days, if the jacks are on, the moment it hits the water, right in on that snag, he's going to grab it off the surface. So if you've got a metre or a metre and a half of slack line, he's going to grab it, take it before you can tension the line, and he's going to have you around the snag, snap you off, take your lure, and you're left with nothing. And I've seen that happen plenty of times as well. So that castability with a lure, getting a technique that you can fire a lure in directly, straight at the snag, and with it tail first, those things really help. The number one tip from, for me is getting your casting accuracy down. Spend your time on that. Really work on that. Never mind buying lures, spending all the money on your fishing lures. Get your casting accuracy down first. That's the biggest tip that I've got for people learning to catch mangrove jack with lures and casting its structure. The other reason for it 
is that in, in uh, really popular rivers like Coomera on the Gold Coast and the Narang, um, some of the spots up at the Sunshine Coast and further north like at the Hinchinbrook Channel, by mid-morning those fish have had three or four offerings. So if you're not landing it right on top of it, right on that fish's nose, you're going to be flat out trying to change his mind. You should be landing it right on top of that fish and making it as easy as possible for him to grab it. Trial and error has got to be one of the best ways of finding a technique, but I think a really good starting point is have a look at the way that a jack feeds in an aquarium. If you've got a mate with a jack or there's plenty of videos on YouTube, just have a look and study the way that they come up onto a bait, how they'll ambush it, how they'll look at it before they go and hit it, what triggers the fish to go and take it. I think that's a really good tip in getting started with retrieving lures for jack. And you'll probably see that's what I'm doing here too. A lot of the time I'm trying to keep that lure in the strike zone. Oh yeah! Yeah, get over there! Oh, I dropped it! It again. Totally addicted, it doesn't really matter what the size of them is. It's just bit down the flies there. Just about squash the flies. Let me tell you exactly what I'm up to. I'm sussing every bit of timber, twigs and shadows in this spot. I've come up onto this great section on a bend of a river. There's horizontal logs, this big brush pile sitting in front of me and I've had a little bit of action. And quite often, the jacks on a spot like this will spread themselves right across every single vantage point. So that's the twigs, the horizontal logs, any little nooks where the shadows are cast over the river. They're really good starting points. So I'm gonna pepper all of these until I've thoroughly exhausted the spot. And I think, hopefully, if the first couple of bits of action haven't scared or spooked the other jacks, 
I think there's a chance of a couple more. Oh, I dropped it. Scared all those mullet away. <laughs> Just pulled it up right beside that tree. And it just started taking off with it before I could tighten the line. Let's we'll see what's on this side. That dark section down the back there. If we can get something in there, that's going to be deadly. Awesome! Off the surface, didn't even get to work it. Oh. You little beauty. Oh. You know they are, they're just... They're so aggressive. Aggressive. The lure just hits the water and before you can even clip the bail over, he's got it in his mouth and he's off trying to get around a snag. And then he started to run along the bank, you know, looking for cover. Although I don't really think they go looking for it, they know where it all is. You just got to try and pull them away from it before they can get there. the craziest feeling to be out here where it's just so calm and still and quiet and to have that happen to you to your lure. It's awesome fun. Insane. Do you ever get sick of having to replace your trebles and your terminal tackle, your split rings and trying to get the gunk or the salt off your lures once they start to um, get a little bit old. This is a little thing that I've, I just picked up from Woolies. It's a Tupperware container and I've just filled it with water and at the end of my sessions all I do is just chuck all my lures and whatever stuff I've been using in there that's covered in salt and chuck the top on it. Give it a real good shake and then this one's good because you can just pull it out and dry it all off, just let it sit in the sun for a little bit. And that way, next time you go to use your hooks and your trebles and that sort of thing, they're not going to be all rusted and you're not going to have to replace them as often. And maybe it's something your local tackle store doesn't want you to know about, but um, yeah, it definitely keeps the cost of replacing all your hooks and your split rings and things down. And it keeps your lures in good nick too.